Hey there. Today, we're exploring the power of collaboration and the undeniable benefits of working with a real estate team, as opposed to a solo agent, especially in the dynamic and fast-paced market of Toronto. And we're going to share insights, delve into real-life scenarios, and decode why the real estate industry is seeing an undeniable shift towards team-driven practices. Our aim? To provide you with a clear understanding of why, whether you're buying, selling, investing, or leasing, working with a real estate team like ours can offer a comprehensive and collaborative approach, better availability, increased support, and a lot more fun. With a detailed list of questions derived from our popular blog, Why Teamwork? We're going to discuss everything from team dynamics to evolved consumer demands to why specialization and diversity in skills within a team can make a world of difference in your real estate journey. Let's do this. It's the second week of June, 2023. We are Fox Marin Associates, Toronto's most innovative and active brokerage in central downtown Toronto. We aren't here to regurgitate boring stats. You can find those anywhere. We're here to share what we see going on in the Toronto real estate market in real time on a weekly basis so you can be in the know and make informed decisions. If you're interested in getting an up-to-the-moment opinion on what's happening in Toronto real estate right now and learning what's going down boots on the ground before it becomes a stat, well, then you're in the right place, my friend. My name is Ian Busher. I am a broker with the Fox Marin team. Keep her number handy. This is my friend, Corey Marin, in-house hype girl and resident expert listing broker. And of course, this guy you love to know, and he's a good man to know, (laughs) Mr. Ralph Fox, our analytical investor-driven macro picture watcher. We do this every week. Hit the subscribe button and join us for the latest updates every seven days. All right, folks, sit back, grab your coffee, and let's kick off our discussion about the pros and cons of working with a real estate team. Corey, I'm going to hand it over to you. Are you ready? I'm ready. I'm really looking forward to this discussion. And as we were brainstorming about topics today, actually, Mr. Fox in the house was like, I think this would be a really good topic to explore. And I could not agree more. And I don't think really people understand the difference between these different models, the solo agent versus the team um, model. And so I think dissecting this is going to be interesting. I'd also like to add that before we started um, the podcast today, we're just briefly talking about how the intention for all of us was not necessarily to start a team or be on a team, but it became an extension of our workplace out of necessity and not out of choice. So I think that's going to come up as a theme today as to why we work so collaboratively uh, with such great um, team members at Fox Marin. So I think it's going to be a really interesting topic to unpack. I am going to tech be the moderator today. And I have pre-prepared some questions for us to dissect and download. And I'm going to toss this first one to Ralph. And Ian, please jump in. And if I have any additional thoughts, I will as well. So my first question is, Ralph, do you feel there is a difference in expertise, knowledge, experience level when working with a real estate team versus the solo agent, which is what we have typically seen in the past few decades. Yeah, I think there's been a big shift to teams for that reason, a shift to teams in the agent population, in um, sales numbers, when you look at stats, who's selling the majority or transacting in the majority of transaction, and who consumers are choosing to use. So there's definitely a shift uh, in place. And I think that shift is is really the answer to the question that you just asked, uh, Corey, which is the bandwidth, the scope, the infrastructure. It's just so much deeper on a good team than any individual person or, or agent could actually ever provide. I think we're going to see this shift continue. I, I don't even think we're at, we're at the midway point, to be honest. So let's just take a step back there for a second. And for our viewership today, can we just break down exactly what the team format is versus the solo agent for those that might be completely naive to this terminology? Sure. A team is when you have a collection of or group of agents Mm -hmm. uh, working under a brand or banner, not a brokerage, but under their own band or banner with infrastructure and uh, employees, full-time employees to support the agents, uh, which then leads to the agents being able to focus on what their strengths are and focus on what their strengths are even within the team so that the sum becomes far more than the parts. Okay. 
And how large is a team, generally speaking? And what are those like numbers look like? Is it like five people, 20 people, 100 people? Like what's the size yeah, it, of the team? Yeah, it can range. I'd say the average would be from, I would say a small team would probably start at about three, probably two agents and it had been. And it could span up to 40 or 50 agents easily uh, in our marketplace. And I think when you get to other marketplaces, you can see them probably even in the up into the hundreds. And then the solo agent is just like one man or woman just running out there alone. Do they have admin? Maybe, maybe an assistant, maybe some type of support, but it would be very limited, especially in comparison to what a team would offer. Do you feel that a real estate team can ensure a better client experience from beginning to end? Uh, whether that's on the buying side, the selling side, the renting side, and even the investing side. Ian, how do you feel about the client experience and how would a team influence that versus the solo one-off agent? I think uh, there's a couple of different things that um, that benefit the consumer in that case. And it's, I think the biggest, the first and biggest is the, the collective experience of every member of that team. Because if they really are working like a team and not not just a, a group of people who happen to be under that same banner, but they really actually do communicate with each other. They share administrative staff, et cetera, et cetera. Then, then you've got, you know, a, a, let's say you've got half a dozen agents, a dozen agents, all of that experience, and not just the years of experience necessarily, but every one of those agents is going to come from a different uh, demographic background. Mm-hmm. So you've got different age levels, You've got different ethnicities, potentially, people who uh, live in different neighborhoods in the city. So I think all of those things working together for one consumer, even if they're running in the background, is incredibly valuable. And really, just to summarize that, it's the you know two heads are better than one expression. Mm-hmm. And in this case, you might have six or 12 heads are better than one. 100%. I think it's even really interesting to think about because when you're talking about the largest transaction or investment or fruition of somebody's goals, like this is a very important transaction. Mm-hmm. This is a very important decision. This is, requires a lot of important counseling. And in order to fully be able to give that to a client, you have to have a lot of experience. And you have to have seen, not just read, but seen and transacted a lot to be able to have that bandwidth. But to be able to have that experience, you would be too busy to have any level of ability to provide the best possible service to your client Mm -hmm. at the same time. It would just be physically, mentally, spiritually, psychologically impossible especially with with the speed that this market works in and so to be able to give the high level of service and the experience and the breadth across a city like Toronto it really really takes the infrastructure and collective experience and wisdom of a team in order to be able to give that to a client and I've seen so many instances where an individual agent is out there alone. And the problem is, is like when you see stats in the Toronto real estate market, those are lagging indicators of what's happened in the market. And so if you want to know what's happening real time in the market, you need to be talking to people who are working actively across the city, almost like like part of the nervous Mm -hmm. system of the real estate of the city. And in Toronto, especially since COVID, things literally can change in a week. Like you can just feel it, you can see it. And so we'll see instances where a solo agent will list a property, not knowing that the market has already shifted and everything's working in multiples as of a week ago. And then they take offers anytime. And all of a sudden they're shocked because they've got 12 offers on the property and they can't even respond to it in real time. And the seller is not best served because of that. So to tap into that wealth of knowledge and to that nerve, the central nervous system of a market that changes and shifts so quickly 
it is so absolutely important. And to be able to know that if your agent gets sick or goes on vacation, that there's infrastructure there. Or if they're busy working on an offer, that there's other people that can pick up the slack. It gives a level of confidence to somebody who's looking at making such a big and significant transaction, decision, move, life change, that they can make these decisions Mm -hmm. because it's not resting on one person and it's not resting on one experience. And when you're working with a really good team that does that, that acts as a team, that is just invaluable. I love that. So you said... Uh, And you mentioned the client experience, which is what we were referencing in the question. And I think that a lot of agents and teams use client experience as part of their marketing collateral. It's in their slogans. You'll see it on their website. What does a good client experience really mean in real estate? What does it really mean, Ralph? It means that the client doesn't even know how good it is. It means that... The client is thinking, wow, this is great, but they don't see all the things that are happening in the background. That that is when it is perfect. And they don't see, you know, all the the pieces that are moving behind the scenes in order to give that experience. That is that is a seamless experience. And real estate and transacting in Toronto, residential real estate can be anything but seamless because there are so many constant variables that are shifting all the time. Lockboxes get broken into, signs get stolen, people break keys and doors, lights don't get turned off, lights get turned on. (laughs) People, you know, do weird things at a showing, people come late, and it's the ability to respond and have the infrastructure. If you're in Leslieville and something is happening at a listing of yours in Bronzesville's, that Somebody's in front of their desk and somebody can be over there and somebody can respond in real Mm -hmm. time, regardless of where you are at. That is a seamless experience and the client would never even know that. Yes. And Mm -hmm. to add to that, I always like the idea that we're thinking two steps ahead of the client. So if you're, whether you're a buyer or a seller or anyone in between, I always want our agents, our brokers, our admin staff, our staging staff, everybody on the team to collectively be thinking, what would the client be thinking right now? Are they worried about X, Y, Z? And how can we resolve this problem before it's a problem? So they're never texting us at 11 o'clock at night, having a meltdown because all of a sudden their brain has fixated on what happens when the home inspector comes and they find something wrong with the house before we go to market? What do we do? I want us to always be thinking, if we're going to have a pre-list inspection and things pop up, I want the seller to already feel and know and be comfortable that through this experience, things will pop up and we're going to deal with them. And we have you know, three days in advance of your listing to address these things. So don't you worry, we've got this covered off. So it's almost like we're doing the worrying on behalf of the client so that they don't feel those things as you just mentioned, Ralph. So I think that that circling back to our theme of the day about the solo agent versus the team model, it's almost impossible in today's day and age to be able to provide that level of customer care and service when you are a solo agent dabbling in all facets of the business. Ian, is there anything you'd like to add to the to the customer experience? You feel like we've tied that off well? I- yeah, I think so. Great. I think I think there there is more that 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 I can add because there's different types of teams as well. And I think the team that gives the best or most superior service, seamless experience to their clients are the ones that are completely vertically integrated. Mm-hmm are the ones that have their own staging, are the ones that have their own designer, are the ones that have their own movers, and are the ones that have their own marketing and marketing department. So they're not waiting on things that are outsourced. And the second you do that, that's when you have opportunities to have more problems and the seamless experience stops becoming seamless because something that was supposed to show up on Monday doesn't show up till Thursday. Mm -hmm. Or a stager's out of inventory and now you have a turquoise couch in a monotone staged 
property. Which we've seen. Many times. <laughs> Um, and so having that integration, having a driver who can run over the end of the city and pick up a lockbox or set of keys and make sure the lawyer has it, somebody's communicating with the lawyer before close. It's just like all of these things that are orchestrated, that gives the true seamless experience. And, and quite frankly, um, with the stakes this high, that is what the consumer wants. That is what the consumer deserves. Mm -hmm. And that is why if you look in any market, they are dominated not by brokerages, and we'll talk about that later, but not by independent agents, but by the larger full service teams. And mm -hmm. there's a reason for that. I think that there's still a disconnect with, this, with the consumer understanding this model and why. And we often say, especially with our first time clients, not necessarily a first-time buyer or a first-time seller, but somebody who might be just experiencing real estate in whatever facet they're experiencing it for the first time, we often say, we don't know how good they have it because they're not feeling it because they don't know how to compare it to another experience. And so all of us have all stayed in one-star hotels in our lives and we've all stayed at five-star hotels. And we know the difference between the two because we've had both experiences. And if you haven't had the experience of the benefit of a team, you don't even know how good it is unless you've had a shitty, horrible experience with another team perhaps, or a solo agent or an inexperienced agent or a part-time agent or an out-of-town agent or an asshole agent, or any other various horrible agents that may or may not be out there. So I think it's a kind of hard concept to sell. And I'm not using that in the terminology that we're relating to selling, but or pitching. It's just that I don't think people know how good it is until they kind of have a little bit more experience in the business in, of real estate. And when we have more tenured, tenured clients, they're like love it. Like they've got their, they can sit back with a cigarette in hand and scotch in the other and be like, oh my God, this is the real estate experience that I deserve and I'm paying for. So moving on, let's uh, speak specifically to the buyer's perspective. How does the team approach benefit a buyer and their process in a fast paced market like Toronto versus a solo agent? Ian, I'm going to toss this with the, uh, to you since you work with a ton of great buyer clients. How does the team model service you as an agent or broker and your client? Absolutely. Um, I think to summarize it with one word, it really is um, assistance, right? Buyer agents live in their cars and the traffic in this city is atrocious. And Ralph yes. mentioned trying to get from uh, the east end to the west end, you know, that'll take you an hour. You can, mm -hmm. you can drive out to the burbs on the highway in an hour, but trying to cross the middle of town because there's a key broken off or there's something that you have to do. So really to summarize it, I think the most important part of this is, is that assistance that you've got, you know, other people that you can rely on, a network that you can call when you're stuck. Um, if I'm, if I've got half a dozen showings in a row, but I need uh, an offer drafted for something, we've got the administrative support system that somebody can jump in and get started on that for me while I'm heading back to the office. I can think of a hundred other examples, but I, I kind of don't want to beat a dead horse. It's just the help that's offered by various team members in their respective fields is invaluable. Totally. And I think strategy is also another huge part of this like talking about offer strategy, when to bully offer, what is, um, do we have any relationships or as part of our network with the listing agent who knows this person? Um, if you've dealt with this listing agent before, I know he or she really good to deal with. What are the challenges here? Has anyone seen this clause before? Like, what do we do with this like weird parking situation or have a weird Kitech situation or something I've never seen has popped up in a status certificate? Has anyone ever dealt with this? And it's that collaborative discussion about how to problem solve, how to come up with really smart strategy, bounce those ideas off, off of other people before taking mm -hmm. those action mm -hmm. steps. It's like, oh my gosh, what a relief. Like, I'm always like, thank God I get to talk about this before I do it. Yeah. Um, the ability to brainstorm. 
totally. with that group. Right? Talk about yeah. valuations and pricing if you're offering on a home. And, and mm-hmm. sometimes it's like not the easiest thing to figure out what your offer price should be. So like bouncing ideas. And often, a lot of us have all shown the same property to different buyers in our network. And so we've mm-hmm. seen the same property and been able to be like, what did you like about it? What didn't you like about it? Where do you think its value will come in at? And where do you expect the sold price to come in at? Like... All of that is just so those the elasticity in that is like where that buyer probably won't know how much they will benefit from all of that material in between all of our brains. <laughs> but that is that nuance, those nuanced pieces of wealth of information is just such a huge benefit to all of us and our clients. And of course, I totally agree. Like the organizational aspect of it, 100%. I mean, there's just no possible way that you can be on the West End and then the East End and everywhere in between and be able to write an offer, doing a pricing analysis and everything else that gets bombarded through the day. So of course, having real-time administrative support at their desks that can you know, pull up a floor plan or survey or go into geo warehouse or pull up past sales history or you know, look a ske- look over a Schedule B. And I also love the fact that, as we've mentioned in other podcasts, whenever we're offering on a property, we're all eyeballing each other's offers all the time to make sure there's no errors in them. Flaw-free. Yeah, yeah like this is yeah. huge. And I like that we all collectively, on behalf of our buyers, often use the same mortgage broker and the same lawyers. And so there's a community outside of our own team that we all use as a resource for additional knowledge and advice, which I think also services the buyer. So I think the team model plays so well into the pace of the market and the buyer process. Um, And I I do agree that it's endless and we could probably spend an entire episode on this. Ralph, would you like to add? And I'm sure you're excited to jump in on this. Yeah, I mean, we work in a city where the current months of inventory is 1.5 months. Mm -hmm. That means that when you have clients and a property comes out day zero, you need to go see that property for all of your clients. Now, if you're doing that, you can't really be worried about staging a property Or you can't really be worried about, you know, your social media posts or booking showings or any of those or working on your branding or writing a blog post or doing any of those things. The market is moving so quickly and the buyers who are best served are the ones that can work with agents who can see a property for them or with them on day zero. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And they are the buyers who are the most successful when they work with agents who fully understand the network, uh, sorry, the market, and can respond in real time. If your agent is bogged down on administrative work or a million other things other than that very thing, the Mm -hmm. client will end up in second place and in more ways than one. Going back to paperwork, we have a four eyeball rule where two other sets of people have to review any offer before it goes in. And as listing agents on the listing side, we cannot tell you how many, how much bad paperwork we see. And not only does it ruin the chances potentially of a buyer agent getting their offer accepted, but oftentimes it could put that agent and that client in some type of financial or legal jeopardy had they known better than submitting the paperwork in the manner with which they did. So having that market intelligence, having the ability to respond in real time because that's what your focus is. And, you know, like, it's so interesting. If you talk to any people who are really, really successful at what they do, no matter what they do, they will say one thing, focus. You Mm -hmm. have to be focused. Mm -hmm. Now, you can be in real estate and be focused on real estate, but you're not really focused unless you're paying attention to one thing. And you cannot be an incredible 
competent, highly experienced, busy buyer agent and seller agent at the same time. It is literally impossible. So that is why teams exist in a market that moves this fast because 20 years ago, it didn't. There wasn't even, you know, the internet. You, everybody worked off a book, you know, but when you have properties that sell in 14 days on average, not the good ones, just the average ones, mm-hmm. on average, you need specialized professionals working in every single aspect of the transaction or the experience to give you as a consumer the absolute best that you need Mm -hmm. and quite frankly, deserve. So this might be a good time to break down what those verticals within a team look like, especially for our viewers and listeners today that might not be as familiar with real estate teams. So what do those silos look like, Ralph? Like you mentioned buyer agents and listing agents. Let's dissect this a little bit more. Why don't you describe some of the roles within a team and why do specific team members, whether it's our team or a team outside of Fox Marin, um, have those roles specifically or responsibilities? Yeah, for sure. Well, going back to what I said, like buying is a full, it's, it's two full time jobs in and of itself. Yes. And so is listing. Yes. And so is being able to market a property and present a property to its highest and best. And then you have the idea of marketing and how to put out content and how to advertise properties and how to create a brand that tells a story that's completely aligned with the properties that that brand and agent is selling. And then, especially in Toronto, you have to have a staging vertical. You have to have a listing coordinator vertical to support the listing agents who are constantly communicating with the client. And then you have to have just admin. So, you know, you're probably looking at like five or six different verticals in order to create that experience, all working together in harmony for the best outcome for the client. Yes. And then in our case, we also have our leasing division as well that works specifically with our tenant clients and our landlord clients. And they did what, 160 leases last year? Correct. Like that's an insane amount of work and an insane amount of volume. And I don't think people, unless you're in this business, understand how much paperwork is involved in a rental and how much the team members on our team that manage that division, how much work they do to earn the living that they have and how much blood, sweat, and tears goes into every rental transaction. It is a lot of work. And and really what that is, is we have a tremendous amount of investor clients. And that is really there to protect our clients. That's not a huge money maker for anybody. It's an additional service that we give so that everything is integrated for our clients' best interest. But there'd be no way, just to like give us an example, for Ian to take on three investor clients rent out their places, have six active buyer clients at the same time and list three properties all in the same week. It would be physically impossible. There's just not enough time in the day. And if you are doing that, then you are not servicing and going back to what the customer experience is about and what their expectation is for and what they deserve to have in a high stakes industry, which it is. And there's a lot of money involved here, both on the actual property itself and then the commissions earned, there's just no way to serve the client if you're doing all nine, 10 of those things within a week. So that completely makes sense. Now let's just extract what the process and the benefit to the team model is, Ralph, on the selling side of the business. And we've touched on this lately, so I Mm -hmm. don't mean to get repetitive. I just think that there's so many different roles involved um, in the selling side of, of the transaction. Again, for our viewers, just to understand what that looks like and why the team might service a selling client better than a solo agent or not. Or not. And what's also interesting is typically a buyer client can then move to selling or a selling client might move to buying. And we sort of watch a client move sort of through all the verticals as they go, which is always really interesting. But again, having that bandwidth to have excellent at all these different verticals is super important. Um, For us, you know, like our staging division, 
Um, and a lot of the bigger teams will do their own staging. It almost is a business and an entity in and of itself with warehousing, with inventory, running inventory sales, movers, uh, secondary storage for our clients, uh, renovating, uh, project managing, uh, notes, decluttering, estate sales, like all of that is really one vertical, living, breathing entity on itself. And then it in turn communicates with our listing coordinator, Olivia. And I know you watch all of these uh, podcasts, Olivia. So big shout out to you because uh, you are such an integral member of the team and Kathy as well on the staging side. And I just don't know where we would be without any of the, with either of them. And, and they're just so integral to... I know where I'd be. Process. In a mental institution. <laughs> in a bar. <laughs> yeah. In a bar beside a mental institution. Yeah, in a bar. Perfect. In a mental... Yeah. Yeah. In a mental... In a straight jacket yeah. in a bar. I kind of like that idea. <laughs> and so they're working in symmetry between Kathy and Olivia and Olivia and Kathy. And then there's the client. And then there's the listing agents quarterbacking, and that could be me and Corey, or that could be any agent on our team, which can plug into that support. And then the whole marketing aspect, which ties into that, which Corey runs for us as well, tied into the whole brand. Um, It's very, very complicated. And then we have a runner, and he is there to support picking up checks, lock boxes. He's driving all feature over the city sheets. for us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Feature seats, putting up signs, taking signs down. We have a separate company that puts out uh, our open house signs. And then we have Emma. Emma, if you're watching, hi. <laughs> we, we, we love Emma and Emma keeps everything in line. And we are a little different from the average team in that we have a brokerage. And Emma keeps everything running on the paper end, on the business end, on the compliance end. And she's integrated in there with Olivia and Kathy and Tony and even with the clients and the clients. And this is another thing, just the whole communication that we have with clients, lawyers that's going back and forth or inspectors. So there's all kinds of different levels of communication that are happening with all the different verticals. And there are so many different text channels that we're all communicating with each other to give that experience to our client. And so all of that gets tied into a brand and an ideology and a philosophy and a communication style and a way to do business. And when it's done at a very high level, creates a symmetry where, where, where somebody is not just able to sell their property at its highest and best, but they're able to do it without a lot of headaches, heartaches, and they're kept in, in tuned with every step of the way as we go through the process on the sales side with them. I love that. And I think just to add to that is it makes it more fun for the selling client too through the process when they know mm-hmm. they have so many of us just at arm's length. And because we all know that real estate's emotional and people want to have a shoulder to cry on or somebody to rant to or to stress to. And I I love the fact that all of our clients, and I'll speak specifically to seller clients right here because we're talking about the process for them, is they really become an extension of us and like our Fox Marin family and they become friends to us through the process because we're like in their house, their homes, in their spaces, and all of us are there. Like it's like they get to know all of us. And, you know, Ralph's really, really familiar with me saying this, but every time we sell a property, I always feel like we kind of go through a breakup period with our clients because we're not messaging like every five minutes on like one of our group chats. And I always say to Ralph, I think they're mad at us. I say it every time because I'm just so <laughs> used to messaging with them all day and like sharing hilarious comments and funny things that happen and shit goes down and like emojis get sent and like we're sending screenshots of funny things that happen or pictures from the open house or something bizarre always happens. And I always really miss them for the most part, I would say. I think that it's that that we're able to offer the selling client that you just would never be able to put a price tag on. And I think it's such a relief. And like, we always say, oh, we over communicate, but like, we really communicate. Like, it's like an 
a lot. And I don't think we'd be able to do that without having the full group involved in all the dialogues and hilarity that we do. Anything else that either of you want to add about the selling, benefiting um, the selling client from the team perspective? And actually, maybe just touch on this, um, Ralph, about a solo agent and a seller. Like what, what would that mean to a solo agent? Why would that be a challenge for them? I think if a solo agent sold two properties a year, it might not be. Mm -hmm. But then again, they wouldn't understand the process. They wouldn't understand the market. And they wouldn't have the infrastructure to give that high level of service. And so it's this catch-22 because if you don't have the experience and you don't have the real-time market knowledge and you don't have the infrastructure, even if you have the time and the bandwidth, you have nothing else to provide. And so that that's the trap of the independent agent right now because things just move so, so quickly and change in this marketplace from interest rates to policy to regulation to, you know, it just, it, the list just goes on and on and on. And so it's just so important to have that infrastructure as Jerome uh, who's actually about his wife's about to have a baby and he's not going to be working very much for the next couple of weeks. He calls it bench strength. And Jerome, uh, if you're listening, I'm doing a shout out to everybody uh, on this uh, on this podcast. But if you're listening, you know, Jerome used to play Division One baseball as a pitcher and he uses the term bench strength. And if somebody gets sick, if somebody... Um, you know, isn't available. There are so many people that can step in on a team and you're not, you know, risking a pinnacle moment, you know, the first week when you go to market and, and somebody's no longer available and you put all your trust in that person. Mm -hmm. You need to put your trust into a team who can facilitate the entire experience and know that, you know, your margin of error is zero and your chances of there being any issues is going to be zero because there's just so much infrastructure to, to, to be brought in. And just to tie this off, I'd also like to add how much fit I think really influences all aspects of our business as well, whether it's a buyer, seller, or again, anyone in between. And sometimes it's really obvious who a client should be working with based on, as Ian had mentioned earlier, you know, age, demographic, where they live, what's their vibe, what's their personality, what's their energy level like, what's their professional background. And oftentimes, like, you know, I'm not the right fit for somebody, but Ian could be the best fit or Jessica on our team could be a great fit. And I think a lot of that really can service the client as well. And I think a lot of people overlook that if they don't understand the group model that we're discussing mm -hmm. today. Sometimes you, when you meet a client for the first time, they are very different from the way they are, you know, a month in looking at trying to make a really big decision. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they have a lower threshold for risk or a higher threshold for risk, or sometimes there are other people involved and the character that you thought is very different from the person that you're now working with. And for us, there have been many times where we've been like, you know what? This person isn't feeling like they're the right fit. We can just interchange with somebody else and still have that first agent involved, just not the main point of contact. And now have the client seamlessly just have somebody else slide right, a shift of energy, shift of everything, mm -hmm. but without really having to make a change or actually miss a heartbeat totally. in their search process mm -hmm. or in their selling of the mm -hmm. property. Totally. And I think it's really obvious too, because Ralph and I often list properties together. It's always interesting to me that one of us just naturally becomes the leader on the listing based on the dynamic with the seller. We never sit back and talk about it. We don't sit be like, who should be, you know you know, number one on this or number two on this. It just one of us becomes the natural leader with the sellers based on our rapport and ability to communicate with them. And that person will intuitively be the one to tell them the good news, tell them the bad news, lead challenging conversations, open up the door for discussion. 
And it happens almost every single time without us having a conversation about it. Just one is just more in sync with whatever, for whatever reason. And that's totally okay because we are servicing their best interests by having that organically happen every time. All right, so my next question, just pivoting a little bit here, I just want to talk about the influence of technology and how it's really changed the face of what we do, even if within our own time frame of being brokers in this business. How has it influenced us as agents? How has it influenced the consumer experience or client experience? And how does that play into the role of the team model versus the solo agent. Ian, do you have any thoughts on this? Clients and consumers these days have access to more information than ever, Mm -hmm. right? Ralph was talking about 20 years ago, pre-internet, we had a book. And I wasn't in the field then, but I've heard the stories from other agents about how you would you know, flip through this book and decide what was right and go to the agent open house on a Thursday and then maybe tell your clients that they should come out on Saturday and see these things that you'd already seen. But you couldn't really send them any information. You had to literally take them there. That was that was the way that it was done. Now we've got House Sigma and Realm and Listed and people are getting these pop-ups on their phone and you're out there with clients for the next four hours and five minutes into your first showing one of your clients will be like, oh my God, what is this? When are they taking offers? We have to go see this yesterday. This is ridiculous. So we need to all be able to react really, really quickly Mm -hmm. and deliver information to them as fast as we possibly can as well. So I think within the team environment, having that support system and all of the aforementioned uh, administration and uh, listing coordinator, and even just other agents, the ability to sort of reach out to the team to say, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a presentation. I'm with a client. Uh, we're doing showings. I'm I'm unavailable for four hours, but I'm looking for a quick response to these couple of questions. Who's logged into MLS right now? Who can do me the favor of uh, checking this out because this person's really anxious? You know, it might be one of your more anxious buyers who's like, I I need a showing for this as soon as I can get it. So I would say, if you're alone and you're in the middle of a presentation and something, and there's a uh, an offer on something, uh, a bully offer and there's just no way to react. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you are part of a team, the ability to admit, uh, I'm overwhelmed, I can't react, but there's an infrastructure there. There's uh, many other members that will be able to help me out and jump in here. Yes, totally. I think it's really amazing how there really isn't a boundary with how much whether it's a working client or a client that you've worked with in the past, or perhaps even a friend or a friend of a friend, how the bound there is no boundary when it comes to the request for information and a dialogue about properties. Like, and I've often said this, and I believe I did an Instagram reel on it, but like I probably get like one to eight screenshots a day from work clients that we have now or ones I've worked with in the past or people I don't know at all, Uh, whether it's in a text message, an Instagram message, a Facebook message, a LinkedIn message, a WhatsApp message, whatever other way somebody can message me, uh, an email, old school, perhaps a fax might come in one day, um, just asking me like thoughts on this property. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that is a very difficult question to answer. Mm-hmm. And if you are really busy and you have, you know, you're in the car all day as we've talked about, or you're helping your stage or you're prepping for a listing presentation, or you're trying to write a marketing proposal or whatever it is to answer the question, thoughts on this property, it's not a two second answer. It, there's a lot of information and research that needs to go in to have thoughts. Mm-hmm. And whether that's price and location and area development and condition and comparables. I mean, it would probably take me four hours to actually really truly answer that question. And so with that access to technology and information, I think there feels like there's like almost like a lack of boundary now where Mm -hmm. you just can be pinged all day long with you know, people tossing out questions, which is great. I want people to feel like they can reach out to me and I want people to feel like my opinion matters, but it's also like almost impossible just to stay on top of those daily requests and communications that come from these various search apps. And people can almost do a lot of their research on their own too, which means like a lot of these apps, as our viewerships know, have 
I built an algorithm with predicted sold price, which is always, 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 always wrong. So I hope you're listening to that. So they're thinking, oh my God, I can get this this cute little bungalow in like Danforth Village for 999. And the algorithm says it's going to sell for... 899. And then all of a sudden they start dreaming about, you know, their new low rise property that they're going to buy and move out of their condo. And they've got this whole plan. (laughs) Meanwhile, they're not even pre-approved. So I think that it can be helpful, but I think it can be really disruptive and very confusing for Mm -hmm. the buyer Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or perhaps the seller. Yeah, it's a yeah. lot. And mm-hmm. so for us to be sifting through that and helping make sense of that for people is where, again, the team model plays into it because it's very time consuming to sort through all of that and educate and provide insight and data and support mm-hmm. those questions. Yeah, we want to be thoughtful and accurate in our response to you, totally. the consumer as well, right? Simply flipping us our thoughts on this and giving you an incorrect response or you know, a, a quick ballpark estimate of price can be a lot to try to pedal back from. So sometimes when we're not getting back to you right away, it's because we want to make sure that what we're sending to you is exactly right. Totally. And well thought out and, and carefully said yeah. for your sake. Totally. The average age of a realtor is something like 55 years. Um, and so, their age or the length of time they've been in the business? Age. Oh, the it is? The average age, yeah, it's old, older than you would think. Oh, I feel so, so young. The average age is, is, is in probably like 55. Really? Um, really. How do people live that long doing this? Well, how can somebody... <laughs> They've only been doing it for three weeks. I don't know how anybody could be Second doing career. this for 55 years, yeah. <laughs> let, alone, let alone be 55 years and in, in the business. So when you have an industry that is changing and evolving so quickly with technology, without being an ageist, being older myself, it's very hard to keep up with all of the changes in technology. And so I know for myself who I'm calling with technological questions and issues and yeah, who are you calling? all the time. Pretty much everybody on the team younger than me, which is everybody on the team. I can be on a Zoom call with Jerome and Jerome used to be in tech. And I just watch him zing around when on a share screen with his computer. I can't even follow the cursor. It's moving so fast and it is so intuitive for him. And that's how he's communicating to clients and that's how they themselves communicate. <laughs> And so, you know, or I have a question with something or like, you know, the new app Realm changes happen in Realm through Treb or Broker Bay and all these changes happen. And the younger members of our team can figure it out and adopt and are so fearless about just diving right in. And I'm looking at this going like, oh my God, I do not want to open this new version of Realm. So I haven't opened it either. Just if that makes you feel better. <laughs> so when you have an aging professional population and you have an industry where technology is changing so rapidly, mm-hmm. um, there's a disconnect. And one of the things that I know personally is how I lean on a lot of the younger, which is basically everyone on our team, but people for help with keeping up and help for access yep. and opinions And if you're a solo agent and you're the average age or even older, on top of everything else, adding this additional layer and then trying to, and then trying to communicate with a millennial in their own terms. And they're the ones that are going to be driving the real estate market for the next 20 years. Good point. It's all out of sync. And so having the ability to have such a wide demographic on a team really helps with the ability to keep up with all the changes that are happening on the tech side of our industry on a day-to-day basis. It it just it's it's amazing. And so I think that's another important that's thing huge. to be thinking about. Yeah. I remember when I was with my former former brokerage, which is a very established brokerage in the city, but it does have a lot of agents that have been in the business for many years that are adorable and are still showing up at the office daily wearing a Chanel suit. I kid you not. I have high respect. And the fact they're still crushing it just blows my mind, but very challenged with technology. They're sitting at these clunky computers and they're like, Corey, can you help me upload these JPEGs to MLS? I'm thinking, oh my God, like how this is, 
I mean, this is a long time ago too. So like, I don't even understand like how they could possibly keep up now. If they're having a hard time like uploading JPEGs to MLS and A, like why are they doing their own MLS uploading to begin with is surprising. I remember thinking, oh my God, like how are they ever going to be able to thrive in this business in five years or 10 years? And service their clients. In 20 years and, and service their clients. And I, I get, I think that's a really good point. I don't think it's really discussed enough. So love that for sure. Ralph, can you talk a little bit about this trend in teams? Um, you are the broker of record at Fox Marin. I know that you look at a lot of different business models, both here in Canada and the US. Like we're seeing this trend across the board. Do you expect or forecast to see um, the continuation and the growth of teams? And if so, what's going to happen with the brokerage model and maybe like dissect what those two things are a little bit more? For sure. I think the one key thing that word that you said is the word business and teams run the real estate experience or service mm-hmm. as a business. The average uh, solo agent they're really not running businesses. They're just running around from transaction to transaction and they're not being strategic in what they do. And so you have these teams and the more successful ones are the ones that are more able to run their business and understand that it's a business Mm -hmm. as a business. And by doing that, they're giving the best service to their clients by having the best infrastructure, by having the best experience, by having the best marketing, by having the best training, by having the best culture, and putting that all together for the consumer. And those are the situations where the consumer is going to win the most and get the most value. And because of that, I think that the uh, days of the solo agent are pretty much over. You will have some outliers out there, but it's pretty much done. And you can just look at every single market and who is dominating and where the business is going and how this trend line is continuing. And so it's very logical. It's first principles and it's happening every day. Um, and so I, I don't even think if you're in the industry, that it really is much of a discussion. It's just, it's what the reality is. And if you're a consumer, it's really interesting to understand because it could impact how you go about hiring your next representative when you're looking to buy or sell or invest in a market like Toronto's. Um, On the brokerage side, it's interesting because it used to really matter Mm -hmm. uh, if you were at Royal LePage or if you were at you know, Century 21 or, you know, these big brokerages and big models basically just used to have templates 20 years ago. You slide Mm -hmm. your picture in here. Here's your folder. Here's your pin. Here's your, here's your briefcase. Off you go. Just go talk to, just go talk to as many people as possible. Those days are over. Uh, And consumers, I really don't think maybe in luxury sometimes, but as a whole, I really don't think they care with what brokerage they're working with. What they care about is who is representing them and what level of service they are able to provide. And because of that, the role of the brokerage has retracted simultaneously to the solo agent because the two of them would, re- those two models were, are, have just become somewhat outdated. And what really, really matters is the level of service that a brand a team is able to provide. And that's why you're seeing teams continue to grow and run businesses um, that in many instances are outseeding, exceeding the size of most brokerages. So do you think it's impossible for a solo agent to operate their business as a business because they just are trying to keep their head above water? Like speak to that a little bit more. Well, the definition of a business Mm -hmm. is in my mind, is you could go away for two months and completely have the business to continue in your absence. Um, By definition, a solo agent can really do that. Mm -hmm. Now, if they had an assistant buyer agent and, 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 and an admin and staging and all of those things, but then they'd be a team. And, and so, you know, the average or as a generalization, 
the solo agent really is in the market like this is just running around from transaction to transaction. Yeah, like I think that it would be impossible to have the space and the time to look at the macro picture of your business as a solo agent because you literally would just be in a survival mode. Like you Mm -hmm. are literally just trying to keep your head above water and keep the clients that you have Mm -hmm. serviced. And I also think the solo agent and we haven't really gotten into this. And I know we're speaking this more from the consumer lens, but like there, there's a cap, like you can only take on a certain amount of clients and you can only have a certain amount of sellers at one time and buyer agents because they're just legitimately is just not enough hours in the day. So you are capped as to how much you can expand, let alone all the other things that we've dabbled in on this conversation, being like a great marketer or a brand storyteller or social media marketer, uh, a videographer, a YouTuber, and all the other expectations that come with what the consumer wants from their agent. I mean, like I even think that people want to make sure that their agent has an Instagram follower now, uh, followers now and they're checking that and they're doing a lot of their sleuth work in advance of even because they can, as they should, they're doing a lot of their work ahead of reaching out to an agent or making contact with an agent and checking out this agent's online digital story. And it's 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 crazy. Like you go online and you look at an agent's website and their blog is from two years ago. Why would you ever hire somebody like that? Or they're using the template that their brokerage gave to them like seven years ago when it's just a one-page landing page that every agent at that brokerage has. As soon as I see that, I'm like, done. In my well, they mind. have four Google reviews from seven years ago. But like a solo agent would not have the time or the bandwidth to be able to possible. create a website or to ask for Google reviews or even consider what that Google business page could do for them or not do for them. So you would just literally be in survival mode versus thinking of your business as a business. So it completely makes sense. And we all know this being team members on a team and we've all been on, you know, and we've all worked as solo agents as well. And I think it's just interesting, like Ralph and I never intended to work together. Like we weren't like, like we obviously, and for those of who don't know us, we live together and work together and we've been together for over a decade now. And when I got into this business, Ralph had already been in the business for, I don't know, like five or six years. We were at different brokerages. I was a junior agent trying to make my way on my own. And Ralph had a very established business and was working a lot in development and pre-construction and investor clients. And we had never no desire to work together. And the the expectation was we're just going to build our own brand separately. And the thing that was interesting is that we were just got so busy, independent of one another, that we had to just start helping each other out, even though we were at two different brokerages. So we just like our businesses just started to naturally cross over because it was like, Ralph's like, Corey, I'm really busy this weekend. Can you take my clients out to see X, Y, Z? I'm like, sure, I'd love to. And then you know, I established a relationship with them, really liked them or vice versa. And Ralph would pop in and oftentimes help me with securing a listing or something that I'd never done before because I was very new. And then organically, we just started to work together and some other things took place and some other opportunities unfolded, but it wasn't like an intentional choice. It was out of necessity to be able to service our clients. Ian, when you joined us, like what was the, the purpose behind that choice at the time? I and, had, and just to jump in, like Ian was the first like person the first. to join Fox Marin, like yep. join the Ian first was, other team was, member. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I had uh so I joined you guys in uh at the beginning of 2016. And it wow. was it was kind of the same thing. I know what that sounds like. Nineteen nineteen hundred and two. 2016 now. Wow. I um, thought you were gonna say 2018. No, sixteen. Wow, and uh, and part of part of the the reason was um, that this same thing of of grow or die. It just it, it just seemed like the next logical step because twenty fifteen I had had listing after listing after listing, and I was getting overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. Right, you are a jack of all trades, master of none. Um, totally. Yeah, it was it was a rash of listings that really sort of burnt me out, and I thought. I need some help with this. And and Ralph, to your earlier point, if I all of a sudden came down with the flu 
and even was out for three days, this would all fall apart. Mm -hmm. Like I needed to be present from uh, pre-dawn until midnight when I finally collapsed every day. And going that way for six or eight months in 2015 was like, there's got to be a better way. Mm -hmm. And uh, and when the invitation came along, it was like, okay, I think this might be it. Uh, and so now they did. I was going to say earlier, one of my one of my most enjoyable things is when we get what I call the relay going, where there's someone who needs to buy before they sell, and yes. I get that client, and I'm with them for four to six weeks, and I develop rapport, and we have a lot of fun together, find that property, and then I hand the baton right to the next person on the team who's like, all right, it's it's on, you know, success for part one. Now let's start working on part two, and then we can hit part three. Um, that to me is is amazing. And even though I've successfully completed my part, I'm still watching and cheering them on until you know the last person in the chain has hit that finish line. So that for me is is really, really interesting and satisfying. But yeah, it got to a a, a not not necessarily grow or die because I didn't start a team, but definitely seeing that it was necessary. Some change was necessary yep. because burnout was imminent. Yep. Or or drastic mistake was imminent, even if it wasn't burnout. Yes. We're going to make a mistake because you were not big enough to handle this all on your own as a solo agent. Yep. And just to circle back on your point, I just love how clients stay in the Fox Marin family for so long, especially because we work so much with referral. And like I was with Ruben today, shout out to Ruben since we're calling everybody out today. And we're doing an the only one we haven't mentioned yet. <laughs> we're yeah. doing an open house today. And he's like, oh, I'm working with your clients, blah, blah, blah. They came from so-and-so. They came from so-and-so. And I was like, oh my gosh, well, they came from this person who came from this person who came from my old job before I was an agent. And it was just the domino effect and the fact that everyone stays within the fold. And probably I know there's some specific clients, I think, um, that have worked with all of us, whether it's a rental from the landlord's side, from one of their investing uh, investment properties, they've sold with us and purchased with us. And then they've all worked all, with all of us in these different verticals. And, I, and they know Emma, they know Olivia, they know Kathy. It just warms my heart. So if you... We're both new agents coming out of a real estate school in 2023. Would you recommend that new agents join a team? And if so, why or why not, Ralph? Oh my gosh, would I ever? Like, we've had uh, a couple agents join our team out of ARIA. And the first thing I'll say to them, even Ruben, before he was in ARIA, he was interning with us, which is a whole other story. But I was I, I I would tell them everything that you've learned in Aria. No, this is l- like nothing like what you've learned, and in some instances you have to start from all over again. Like yeah. it's great that yeah. you're licensed and you you know have some level of efficacy with paperwork, but after that you have to relearn everything and start from scratch, and it's probably going to take you at least two years maybe three to actually get your sea legs to be able to really understand what is going on and how to best service your clients. 100%. And the analogy I use there is when you get your M1 license, you <laughs> do a written test from a book. Yes. That's the first part of your license. The second part is, okay, now get in the car. I'm taking you driving downtown. Yeah, That's basically what actually yep. jumping in is like. Listen, like when when you're running around with a buyer with a million dollar budget, like this is serious. This is 100%. real. A hundred percent. This is not learn on the job. <laughs> Shouldn't be anyways. And no. just like lawyers where the stakes are very high have articling. Yeah. You know, I think there should be articling periods in real estate before you transact. And if you're new in the business, it would be like, what a great way to learn from a whole bunch of people totally. in a great environment with backup and infrastructure mm-hmm. and support so that I can set myself up from success from day one. It should be mandatory. We've talked yeah. about this, right? Yeah, we yeah. have. Yeah, Lawyers yeah, and have. articling. And I am a licensed carpenter and I had to do three years with a journeyman. I had to do right yeah. a pre- a, an apprenticeship. And shout out to Gord, by the way. <laughs> Gord, if you're watching, hey, thank Gord. you. Thank you. Thanks, Gord. Eternal gratitude, Gord. Um, but yeah, I think it should be mandatory. I think there should be a two-year period where you actually have to find an agent who is willing to sponsor you 
and give you your 24 months of experience before you can actually do anything. Yeah. And the idea used to be you would join a brokerage and the broker would, but you know, most people don't even know who their broker of records are um, or, you know, see them once a year at a company party. Like, so it, it, it really would be the smartest thing to join a, a team that performs at a high level where you can learn the, from the best of the best and start your career off that way. And I, I, yeah, and just know that there are just so many facets. Just start with one and slowly build your knowledge base up. And then, the, and then another point to this too is when you finish real estate school, and we've talked about this on our podcast about how to be a great agent, which is a really good resource for the agents that are listening to this. So I'll make sure I post that in the show notes uh, because we've talked about some, there's some great nuggets in there. But I don't think that people realize how lonely this business is. Yes. Mm-hmm. Like just really effing lonely. <laughs> it really is. Especially if you're coming from the corporate world or, you know, a busy company or where, wherever you're departing from. And then you get into this business and you're like, I'm by myself all the time. Like a lot. And mm-hmm. so just to have the camaraderie and the spirit of other people and just the feeling of being able to soak in information and listen and bounce off ideas and ask questions, like what a freaking relief. Just that mm-hmm. alone, mm-hmm. it's like almost like your own built-in therapy group because nobody else is going to understand what you're going through as an agent, whether you're new or you're very tenured that it's a really tough job. But you can't complain about being a real estate broker to anyone. They think that we all like run around with like bags of cash, and gold chains, and we're lunching, lunching, and driving yeah. around in our Mercedes and going on vacation all the time. You can only really talk about the meat and potatoes of what this can do to your soul <laughs> at times with other people who have gone through it, and like that. A lot of the time, you'll be crying or raging or shaking or having a sleepless night. So you need to have that like little bit of a cocoon so that you've got that feeling of camaraderie. And I think that makes a massive difference to making this transition when you get out of school and get into the business and know that you're just not out there like a flake. And what do I do? What do I do? I feel green and I feel broke and I feel horrible about it. (laughs) What Mm -hmm. did I do? So Mm -hmm. I think that's huge too. Ralph, I can ask you one question just to tie off our conversation today. If you were speaking to an agent or a broker that said, Hey, Ralph, you know, I really respect you, bro. Um, <laughs> hey, man, I want to start a team too. I love your guy talk. Corey. Yeah, bro. <laughs> um, yeah, bro talk. You know, I want to start a team too, man. You know, w- you know, can you give me some advice? Like, you know, what worked for you and what didn't work for you? And like, what should I know and not know? How might you answer that question? It's a good question. I think the first piece of advice that I would give is, have you done the work yourself? Have you experienced the business on all sides at a high level for a very prolonged period of time? Everybody, you know, wants to fight Conor McGregor, but Nobody wants to do the the work in the mm-hmm. gym mm-hmm. for five years, for 10 years. And I think it's a common thing due to HGTV and million dollar listing. Like everybody just thinks in real estate, you just pick up the phone and say 4.5, we're in escrow and the deal is done and you just made $700,000 in commission. That's not how real estate works. That's not how being an agent works. And it's certainly not how running a team works. And so I think you have to get to a level where you've seen all facets of the business that you understand it before you can start to mentor people, before you can uh, create a brand, and before you can tell a true story that's actually based on something. So I think having that base level of experience is super important because I've seen a lot of people try to start teams and they don't really last very long. And, um, And so I think that's one thing. I think the other thing is like anything, it always looks far easier from the outside than on the inside. And it's very difficult to get a group of people to do anything. It's 
really, really hard to run a business that's so multifaceted, dynamic, and fast moving with so many big personalities and have them all share a vision, get along and work towards that vision. And that is not an easy thing. And um, it's, I think, the last thing somebody's really thinking about when they think about creating a team, right? They think about um, income and revenues and they think about uh, how it would be perceived from the yes. outside and all of that, but they don't think about the human dynamic. And I've been in other businesses and I've run other businesses and I've been in sales all my life. And the biggest challenge of any business is the people. Always. And so clients, team. So I think that would be a big thing that I don't think somebody would see or understand until they were in it. And I see so many agents where it's like, oh, I have a new buyer agent. And you're like, oh my God, that's going to last like six months. <laughs> And it usually does. Um, and so just, and the other challenge is just because you're, you're successful as an agent, it doesn't mean you can run a business. And it doesn't mean that you can, you know, look at numbers and spreadsheets and forecasts and cash flow and do all of the things that make a successful business, but do it on a real estate level. So there's a lot of things that people, I think, who want to start a team don't think about or see or understand. And those are all the types of things that you really want to open somebody's eye to. And that's why while teams are the future and they are the growing part of, of, of real estate, there's very few of them, good ones, that mm -hmm. are growing continually. And you know, I think over time, these teams will start to amalgamate into other teams. And you'll start in the US, you hear about super teams. That's not really something in Toronto yet, but you're starting to see that happen as more and more people leave the industry because it's a lot harder than most people thought. And um, you'll see a more and more consolidation happening mm -hmm. where little teams will start to really struggle against the big teams. I don't think that's happened yet, but I think that's coming. Yep. And and so it's really, really important to be able to understand that there's a business dynamic, there's a personal dynamic, and there's a basic understanding of the business and all facets of it that you have to incorporate in order to have, build, run, and grow a team. Mm -hmm. And people, even agents, always see the outside. They think, oh, wow, look at all these, look at the sales revenue or look at, they don't see all the expense. And, you know, if you're a single agent, you don't have very much expense comparative to what a team does to have the monthly infrastructure in place 24 seven to give that level of service. And so there's a lot of things that I don't think somebody would be thinking about because they just, they don't know, they haven't experienced it, they don't understand, but it is very, very, very different. I totally agree with that. And I mean, like you and I have worked on this for a very long time and we've worked very hard. And like, I have no doubt in my mind that we've worked very hard. And I think one of the biggest changes and I think something that's permitted us to grow, especially between the two of us, and we could probably do a whole episode on just building the team and like how it all started and like how we've gotten to this place and where we want to take it is we had some business coaching and it had to be uh, a conversation really like, who is the leader here? And I was actually really okay with it not being me. Like, you know, I know, like I, I am not a natural leader. Like I just was okay with that because I'm just not. I am a doer. I'm an executor. I'm like, Sorry, same. Ian? Oh, yeah. Same. Yeah. Same. Like, I want to just get shit done. Right. I know yeah. my, but it was like a humble thing to have to be able to be like, this is not my role here. My role is like to be creative and to tell a story and to pump out volume and content and create things and message things, be spirited, be like the cheerleader. Like, that's great with me, but I can like give this up. And I think that that was a really helpful part of us being able to 
help accelerate in our strengths and weaknesses. And I think everyone on our team is really good at that too. Like Ian, you just mentioned like you're a doer and you like being in the doing role. Like I feel like it's really important in the team dynamic for everyone to know what their strengths and weaknesses are and then excel there and then how have everyone support you versus everyone kind of like power struggling through everything. And like, it was such a relief to feel like I didn't need to like play that part because it's just not who I am. So I think when people are trying to build a team, they need to be very careful and nuanced about that too, because it's, if you're not a natural born leader, like it's not the easiest thing to learn how to do. Like, I think it has to come from an organic place. And so that's another like a little bit of nugget there. Even though you say that, Ian, I think I consider you as a leader on the team and you're always the calmest guy in the room and you're always the voice of reason. And it's, you know, one of the things I've heard you say that we both share is, is that we really like working with the younger people on our team who have less experience than us. And it's so nice to be able to pass that on. And I know a lot of the younger agents on our team will call you and they don't even want to bother me because they know that you'll be able to help them with a problem or answer something through or talk something through. And so, you know, you do have a lot of those traits. And I think you and I both share in just getting enjoyment out of being able to pass on, oh my God, you know, how many years of struggle and banging our head against the wall and saying, you might want to do this a little differently so that you don't have to experience Yeah, 100%. 100%. We I, went put, through. I put my hand up and I said that and I thought about it after. And I'm, I'm definitely not, you know, one of the drone bees. I think there's, a, there's an interesting dynamic. I am aware of the fact that I don't necessarily want to be the leader, but I do have some leadership qualities. And I think that makes me a bit unique that I can... But I, again, I go back to that know thyself, right? Mm-hmm. The, the dynamic between the two of you was you take the lead, I will be your strong second position back up and do all the things that you don't want to do. So I think that's the other thing too, is know where you can slide in and add benefit, right? And every member of this team does that. Everybody's totally. got something that they're a bit more specialized in than somebody else. Totally. And we all help each other with that. Yep. But and you, you can't put, value on, you know, eight, nine years of trust. Yeah, that's exactly. That's never been broken. And to Corey's point, if we were all just a bunch of bros that showed up for a meeting and uh, we were just chest bumping and, you know, ego boosting and talking about everything that we were great at, then we were never going to get anywhere. There has to be a spirit of cooperation within a team too. And and the thing that I think that, and this could be a whole other podcast, but that's so important to all of us as leaders on our team is we always want to see everybody grow. Totally. And I think, I think this would be the biggest mistake for anybody trying to build a team is they want to be the front person and they want to have all the glory and they want everyone else to be like minions. Like my biggest joy is seeing, you know, some of the younger team members flourish and step into themselves and putting themselves out there and, and doing that, you know, it's such an amazing thing to see without ego. And I think one of the things I've learned about, you know, the best leaders are the ones who are able to do it without without ego. And and if everybody around us is winning, then we're winning. And if we're winning, then our clients are winning. I love this. Let's definitely bookend this um, here. But I think that we should circle back on this aspect of the conversation in a future podcast, because I think this is really juicy and interesting. So let's definitely come back to it for sure. I think this has been very, very helpful. Is there anything just briefly that you want to say about solo agent versus team? Anything else you want to cap this off with either of you? Or are you good? I found it kind of therapeutic. Like <laughs> I just wanted to reach out and virtually hug Group hug. Group hug. For a minute there. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> Yeah, I wasn't going to add a lot, but I was going to say, I mean, I've been here, as you mentioned, from the beginning, and I've seen the things that worked and didn't work and watched you guys have periods of struggle and then periods of great success. And it's been really interesting and eye-opening for me. So thanks for having me along for the ride. We are so grateful to have you. Very grateful. Well, in saying that, Ian, would you like to close us out for the day? Absolutely. Through our conversation, we've uncovered the immense value of the team approach. 
from diversity of skills and perspectives to increased availability and faster response times, a real estate team truly brings unique benefits to the table. And remember, whether you're buying, selling, investing, or leasing, a good real estate team can make the process not just more efficient, but also more enjoyable. We hope you've enjoyed this discussion as much as we have and that it's given you a better understanding of why teamwork is truly the way forward in real estate. If you want to learn more or have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Corey, what do we always say? Contact us. We're nice and we're super fun. We certainly are. And Ralph, do you have anything you'd like anybody to do before we sign off, sir? For sure. Actually, there's two things. One, there's a red button that says subscribe. Please smash that subscribe button and hit that thumbs up for like. Uh, We'd appreciate it so much. It helps with the algorithm so more people can hear us spread the gospel (laughs) of Fox Marin and Toronto real estate and educating our clients as to what we're seeing boots on the ground. So we'd love to hear from you if you have questions. Talk soon. Bye, guys. Thanks, Thanks so much. Cheers.